Hello, everyone. Growth is key to achieve long-term prosperity and well-being for all. At Bridgewater, this is our mission and everyday obsession to develop value networks that bridge and deliver growth opportunities. If, like us, you believe sustainable growth is key, this is your podcast. Welcome to Let's Scale, the Bridgewater podcast powered by Scale Up Valley that puts growth at the center of conversation. We are Paul Morgado and Ana Paula Reis, the founders of Bridgewater and your hosts for the session. Today, we have uh, with us Michael Durant, founder of The Interner, joining us from London. Michael, welcome. Thank you. And let's move to the first question immediately. What is your company, The Interner? Brilliant. Thank you, Anna and Paolo. So The Interner really sits at the middle of entrepreneurship and education. And so in a nutshell, what we do is we connect startups from across Europe to the most ambitious pre-trained UK students who are looking for internship opportunities. So we're very much focused on, uh, on the UK. We understand the UK education system, but we also understand the difficulties of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs wanting to grow and understanding or trying to understand how they can actually do this. Who are the, what's the team that needs to be behind them? And we're really focused on working with the UK universities and students who have the opportunity to go abroad and work in countries like Spain, Italy, Germany, France, Portugal. And by connecting students to startups, we're able to facilitate this, uh, to facilitate this connection and also to help these, uh, help these startups grow. Now, one of the things that we do that differentiates, differentiates us as a, um, as a company, in fact, is that all of these students, before they go abroad, before they start with their, with their organizations, they're actually run through a four-week program. Now, this program, we term it zero to one, but essentially what this program aims to do is to take a student from not knowing anything about entrepreneurship through to someone who is capable of walking in the door on their first day at the startup and helping that startup to grow. Quite often, we found that one of the problems that, that entrepreneurs had was that they were hiring great talent, but didn't have the time to then train that talent once the talent arrived at, at the organization. As you both know, as well as founders, we're often, uh, have, we often have a lot on, on our plate and we're having to be here, there and everywhere. And we have to wear several hats um, at several times during, uh, during one particular day. So the notion that we'd have the time to sit down and train uh, new employees or indeed our interns who, who don't have uh, the real world practical experience yet is something that we really wanted to solve at the interna. And so what this program does is it takes students through three core elements that we think define the initial stages of entrepreneurship, which break into startup strategy, in which we look at things like the lean startup design thinking, blue ocean strategy, for example, through to helping a company try to find their first uh, their first sale, their first customer. So essentially looking at sales and business development. And this is where we look at a few, um, a few topics within sales, such as value selling, challenger sales, all the way through to how do we actually present. So using things, using tools such as the pyramid principle. And then finally, once we've nailed the problem and understand you know, what, what solution there could possibly be and finally got some traction with, with clients, we then look at spreading the news, spreading our, our idea of, wide, far and wide. And that's where we'll use digital marketing. So the third area is, uh, is digital marketing. So one of the key things and key principles is that four weeks before the intern actually arrives at the startups that we work with, they are working on the startup's biggest, biggest business challenges, but also understanding their, their world. So each student will be working, um, will be working with essentially the workbook that they then complete is done with the startup that they're startup that they're going to in mind. So once they actually arrive on that first day, rather than turning up and asking, what can I do to help? Or how does this work? How does that work? They've been given the opportunity to actually dive into a lot of these um, challenges that obviously entrepreneurs face, face every day and often don't have the time or find it difficult to actually explain what it is that's, that, that's, going, that's, going, that's going wrong or indeed what's going right. So I guess that one of the questions that we, we often get quite a lot is why are you therefore best placed to 
give a give a training program to interns before they start and i always think that's a that's a brilliant question and i think that it comes down to who is our main client our main client client is our, our startups so every day we work with entrepreneurs which means that perhaps quite quite selfishly and also luckily for myself i've had the opportunity to speak to founders uh, across across europe uh, and really understand what it is that's made their business tick how they've gone from zero to one and then how they've scaled uh, after that and actually learned from the from their mistakes as well and what's what's amazing about it is that obviously we have we have clients that range from fashion tech through to ai through to um through to through to big data companies and so we're not just focused on on one industry we are indeed industry agnostic but what we're really focused on is that element of of entrepreneurship and as as i mentioned at the beginning we really try to combine uh, and really sit in the middle of those two principles of education and entrepreneurship and as long as we're doing those then um uh, then we're hopefully on the on the right track to delivering our, our goal, which is obviously helping startups to grow by being their partner for looking for the top UK interns. Okay, so uh, to those that are listening to us, you are on a continuous process of uh, selecting people from universities, okay, yeah. for trainees from the universities. So explain us a, be a little bit better what is the criteria both for selecting the universities and then within the university to select the students that you you think that are mm -hmm. the most suitable for this mission of helping the startups of course that's that's a that's a brilliant question so i think maybe take it in two parts of so the, the first one how do we we select universities so we work with with a select number of universities across um across the uk and we certainly don't exclude any Uh, if they're interested in uh, in working with us, because what we strongly believe, and what I'd seen from my own experience previously, is there were there were a lot of internship companies who, in fact, the client uh, was or the client within this marketplace was actually the student themselves. And what that what what that can often do is restrict the talent pool that you're able to attract. And and so, whilst we you know, don't exclude any universities, there are certain certain universities which might have particular skills in certain fields which we will work with a, a, a little bit more. Uh, and then onto your second question, which was really around uh, how do we then select the students that would go forward? I, I guess this, this, this links to a, um, perhaps something that's actually key to all entrepreneurs and all businesses is that we really believe in having the client at the center of our business. So before we even go through a selection process of which students would go through an interview, I first sit down and work alongside the entrepreneur to understand what it is that they are really looking for in the um, in the students or indeed in the, all of the employees that they want to help grow their business. And so having that, I can then move on to having interviews with the students themselves before they then are put forward. Um, but indeed, I think one of the biggest attributes that that, I, that I've seen in the business that, that I've been in for the past four and a half years is really that if you hire for traits, if you look for certain traits in people, then rather than capabilities right at the beginning, then I think that you generally tend to find there's a, there's a, there's a better outcome. Um, because I think if you're both working towards a common goal, and once you can see, you can naturally see a common goal between what that particular entrepreneur, what the culture of that particular startup is and where they're focused, and also the interests of those, of those students. And it's when those have aligned that we really find the most value for, for both. Uh, okay. You're an, an entrepreneur yourself working to help other entrepreneurs because startups is your uh, area, your, your main market. Tell us your story. Why and how and uh, where did this idea come? What triggered the uh, starting of the Interna? Of course. So, um, in fact, Anna, the way that the Interna actually came about was through a personal, personal experience of mine. So when I was at university, I was lucky enough to go on uh, what they term in the UK a year abroad. And that means that you're able to spend a year in, <clears throat> in another country. So uh, I was lucky enough to split my time between Paris and Rome. And when I was in Paris, I was looking for an internship in Rome. And well, in Rome, I well in Italy. And I, I was making literally hundreds of applications and was hearing very, very little back. And then I resorted to finding, e finding companies on the internet and just emailing them directly. I then even went on to making calls directly and saying, look, can I, 
work for you. I'm looking for an internship. I think I can add value to your business. Um, please, could I, or all I'm looking for is an opportunity. And what I found was that at the time, the companies were fairly skeptical as to saying, why is there an English or, or UK intern wanting to come over here? How does it work? And they were fairly confused. And luckily, one, one person at a company called BizPlace in Rome uh, gave, me a, gave me the opportunity. Um, I'd only spoken to the founder of the business, Federico Palmieri, um, once before, and that was on Skype, and then decided to book my ticket to Rome and, and turned up. And once I'd, once I'd turned up on my, on my first day expecting to see, I knew, I knew it was a startup. I was assuming 10 to 15 people working there. And when I turned up, it was just me and him. So he was 22 and I was 21. And he had this vision of helping other startups in Italy, raise investments from, raise investment from angel investors, business incubators, accelerators. And so together we tried to start this place and start building it up from, from, uh, from where it was then uh, into an actual business. And in fact, by the end of my time there, because I had to come back to university to finish off my studies, I thought I've had such an incredible experience working in a startup. I learned an incredible amount because rather than going into an organization and doing one particular task for the whole of the, of the number of months that I was there, in fact, I'm, I was able to see the whole product lifestyle actually, actually trying to build a business. So working in a startup, I found that I was able to get experience across sales. I was marketing the accounts, the legal side, the network side, the business development side, and also obviously the negatives of entrepreneurship where people aren't happy with what you're, with what you're producing or where the technology doesn't work. Uh, but actually, it was through those experiences that I learned an incredible amount. And in fact, Federico, who I'd worked with to start this place, also absolutely loved the experience. And that business continues uh, today and has actually been uh, been very, very successful. So once I got back to university in my final year, whilst I probably should have been doing more work <laughs> for my for my degree, in fact, I was then trying to build the interna. I was trying to think... How can I give other students the same experience I had, but indeed also give other startups who have got a dream, other entrepreneurs who want to build, uh, want to build a business, want to build a new service line, the capacity and the ability to take on someone who's ambitious and wanting to learn to help them take their business forward, but not have to take on a full-time employee. And so really what that, what that meant was that off the back of that, I decided to try and, and launch the internet and, and first I made, I made a big mistake. So I thought, I thought I can do everything. I can connect students from all across the globe to companies all across the globe and put together this very poor looking website and then realize that I didn't have any connections there. I didn't think before I'd actually started. And so in fact, what I learned pretty quickly was actually being really, really niche when you start it was massively, massively important. And so what I'd done instead was tailored it back and just focused simply on the university I was at and with startups in Italy. And then off the back of that, once we started to get some traction and I could learn from customers, learn what they liked, what they didn't like, that meant that I was then able to start to build it a little bit bigger, whereby it was going more to Spain, Germany, France, et cetera. Back that. So, yeah. And, and uh... Well, you started the company and uh, you started to have the first clients. Uh, is there any representative client or a representative uh, project that you, you want us uh, to know more about it? Sure, uh, uh, absolutely. I'll, um, there's one, one, one project, one client, which I really love working with uh, in, uh, in, in particular. Um, given that I haven't spoken to them before this podcast, I'll keep them unnamed for now. Um, but they were working in the, or are working in the Spanish market and a, a startup there very much focused on the electoral system and had a really exciting piece of technology, which, um, which could be used in essentially counting votes and things like that. And, um, and they came to me with, uh, with a proposition essentially saying that we want to uh, gain more exposure to the UK market we're not sure where to start. We don't have a huge amount of, of investment, but we need, we need a couple of interns who are self-starters, but can also try and help us build 
that business in the UK. Now, that sort of question to go to find someone who's 20 or 21 years old to help you do that is an extremely difficult, uh, is an extremely difficult task because quite often to hear something like that is rather daunting. So with that in mind, I, I took it as a, as a real good challenge and actually spoke to quite a few interns uh, before proposing any of them. And then once we had what we made, what, what I made sure was that during that training phase, that with those interns, we really focused on the sales and business development side. So really understanding how they could use value selling or challenger sales in their um, in their progress and in in, in, in the way that they um, uh, and in the way that they sort of presented themselves and presented the presented the product. That in fact that was um, uh, that was something that that for me was one of the greatest achievements I'd say, but also one of the most insightful um, insightful things that we'd seen because it, we really were able to understand what that client wanted. And we were able to find the right people and then indeed find the right traits, train them in the right way so that they could deliver value from the day that they walk through the door rather than taking the time to be to have to get up to speed that quickly. Michael, tell us exactly about that. You said uh, you could understand exactly what they wanted. So tell us the process. How uh, did you add value to that customer? What did you do to understand what, the, what their problems were? What was your process to get there? Absolutely. So great question. So I sat down with the, with the founder. We had a, uh, we had a half an hour uh, conversation in which I was really trying to understand his dreams, his goals, his ambitions in, uh, in his business, and then also in the products that they, um, that they had and that they were offering to, um, uh, to the community. And through that was essentially a series of, of questions. So this was more of the discovery, essentially I, I, I term it as more of a discovery call. So quite often, Quite often, what I've I've found on um, on certain calls you calls you might have or with, with with certain organizations is that a lot of the time you're hearing the salesperson or the person who's trying to sell to you speak most of the time, and I certainly think that it's certainly in the initial calls that listening is hugely underrated, um, and also listening to understand rather than just listening to get your answer and and not really taking in what they're, what they're saying. So by really understanding what this, what this client wanted to do, I could see that actually a lot, what, what, what they had in mind was moving into the UK market without any contacts in the UK market, without the investment prospect of hiring a sales closer, but also thinking that there was a huge potential for this uh, in the UK market. Now, with that, with that particular problem, there were there would have been very few to no interns that would be able to immediately go into that market untrained and deliver value for for that client. And so, what what we'd essentially done in that was actually sat down and understood the product, understood how we could really get this product to work in uh, in the UK market. And so what I did was I re when we were looking at the interns of applying, there were two areas I was looking at, economics and politics. So was there anyone who was studying these subjects? Because that would at least give us the initial stage, the initial push of interest, the initial trait. And luckily enough, I came across uh, a couple of those, couple of, couple of those students, sat down with them and had a, had a chat with them and and really tried to understand what their ambitions, what their goals were, and found out that actually both of those students were extremely passionate about politics. They were extremely passionate about, well, they're extremely ambitious as well. Um, and by aligning those two views, I initially thought there could be a good match here. Post, oh, go on, Anna, sorry, you had a question. Do you have any haha moment? A story when you really understood that with that project, because I can see it in your eyes, how important the project was. So one specific story that, you know, that moment changed something for the better uh, in that project. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's a, re it's a really good question. Um, I think the moment, the moment that really, um, that really stood out to, stood out to me in, in that, in that particular project where we were trying to um, help them engage in that, in that UK market was, mm, was probably the, those, the, essentially it was those initial, um, those initial calls to really understand that, um, that there was a, that there was a time constraint on, um, on this founder. So the founder had taken on investment. He needed to move fast. He wanted to accelerate growth outside of Spain, but was also constrained to Spain. So with that aha moment, essentially it was saying, this can't be a normal process whereby there's a nice match. They both get on and actually it's quite a, um, quite a simple maneuver where it's one, one fits into, into another. We've matched them and they've gone through the training program and then they're delivering value. Rather, this one, there was a time constraint, which meant that actually by, by knowing that, it meant that for us, it was much easier to essentially reduce, that, reduce the talent pool to what was, at, to what was, a, to what was going to specifically fit, uh, fit that need, which was time constraint. So it meant that we needed to look for someone who had particular experience, as I mentioned, economics and politics, but also some work experience. And one of the students actually was already a little entrepreneur themselves by selling tickets at um, tickets at university. And so what I quite liked about that was there was a little bit of ambition. There was a little bit of, of salesman in, uh, in him already. And actually, when we went through that training and when we focused on the sales process, they then implemented that into the, um, into the business itself. Fantastic. So you have a, a, a lot to, uh, of learnings when you do projects. Uh, it's clear for us because you are explaining those. Uh, what, what, what type of learnings changed your initial view of uh, what could be interna, the interna, and then what kind of, I wouldn't say pivoting because it's maybe too, too strong, but at least adjustments that you uh, followed just because you had some learnings in some projects. So tell us about the evolution of the interna uh, mm -hmm. in terms of adding value to the client. What were the, the lessons that you incorporate on your business model, in your business model? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that always, uh, always sticks in my mind and one thing that I had to learn really early on is that certainly within a marketplace where with what, we're doing is a very human, uh, human business. The importance of really focusing and understanding your client inside out is extremely important. So what are their likes, dislikes, their ambitions, their goals, their hopes. And this then led to the importance of actually getting client feedback. And so interestingly enough, when I first started the interna, the initial training program that we offered before students went out didn't actually exist. So this was simply a, um, essentially a matchmaking service between startups and interns. And what I was then looking at was really trying to get some more client feedback as to what, what was working and what wasn't. And I kept getting very similar feedback from a lot of the companies that I was working with. And they were saying, look, it takes around six to seven weeks before, uh, before we really see value from the intern, it takes us a lot of time working with them, et cetera. And then similarly from the student perspective, saying, look, it's, it's really great and, and you can get up to speed quite quickly, but it takes around six or seven weeks before I'm then able to work, work alone on things and can take my, my own projects forward. So I sort of sat down and said to myself, how can I, I set myself a goal? How can I reduce that time from seven weeks to one week? That was the goal I had in mind. How can I reduce that time so that it's massively, massively valuable for both sets of, uh, but essentially both sides of the marketplace, as you'll know with Bridgewater, with the two sides of the marketplace, trying to make sure that both are, uh, are satisfied. And that's where that training program then, uh, then came in. But obviously, again, that was driven by the feedback that I got from entrepreneurs and understanding what it was that helped them build their business from zero to one. So, uh, so quickly. So I think that the, the first learning would definitely have to be around, 
um, customer centricity, having the client um, right at the right at, right at the epicenter. I think. And, and Oh, go on. Yes, of course. No, ju ju just a, a small reflection about what you have just said. You have two sorts of clients, the startups in one side of the platform and uh, the, the students on the other side of the platform. And one must uh, allow the development of the other and so on. So uh, usually we have this idea of chicken and egg problem because uh, Sometimes platforms are not very interesting for one side because you don't have many people on the other side. I believe you bet for having the student side covered to offer the student side to the companies. Is this correct? Yes. Yeah, so you def we definitely need to start with um, bringing students together. But then, as you exactly as you say, it's difficult in terms of chicken and the egg because to get students interested, you need to have opportunities. To get startups interested, you need to have the, the talent pool. And so the question is, where do you where do you focus first? And I think that from the learning that we got is we have a phrase in English, which is where do you get the biggest bang for your book, right? Which is essentially, you know, where can we where can we invest our time and often the little capital that you have when you first start start the business and get the largest results? And how do you measure that ROI and then how do you implement it? And so what I found was that it was actually working with the students first uh, because of where I am, where because of where, where I was at that particular time. So there, there's a um, <clears throat> well, as you as you probably uh, as you probably know within within the ideas of sort of the lean startup or or a book or book by Ash Marie called Running Lean, he talks about an unfair advantage. So what when you're an entrepreneur, when you're starting a business, what's your unfair advantage? That means that within this business, it's not. Uh, or indeed the, the industry that you're trying to get in, it's not a level playing field. And so I was at that time already entrenched into the university itself. I was a, I was a student at that, at, at that time. And so unlike somebody else who was say, trying to do say something similar to me, who was not in the university or the, the UK university system at that time, I was in an unfair, unfair position. And so what I knew is that during that final year that I had, at university, I had to make the most of uh, of uh, of that position, and that's why Paolo started with with the students, and then moved on to uh, moved on to starters. Michael, a uh, very interesting uh, story and conversation and reflection on a, such an important part, which is talent. And interns are not always uh, realized uh, or seen as a, a valuable, seriously valuable asset that you are bringing that perspective and. And we at Bridgewater know how it is because uh, we we have been using some of your uh, uh, of your help, um, and so we know how important that is. Now let's move to a bit of our partnership and tell us tell us what are your goals uh, in this partnership. Sure, I think it, it's a brilliant question, and and it's been great to uh, great to have this partnership so far. And I think that perhaps if we go. Straight, straight to the crux of it of what we're you know, really looking to looking to do is to actually build that network across Iberia and really, really push growth there. So my largest market, uh, as I said, I initially started with Italy. My largest market is now Spain. I'm keen to drive this the same amount of growth there for Portugal, uh, Portugal as well. And what I really love about the partnership and certainly working with uh, with Bridgewater is actually being part of such a strong network so seeing the organizations that you both work with that have bought in to um to the network is extremely important and i think it, at the end of the day to, to a large extent both bridgewater and the interna are network based uh based businesses and so actually that partnership is is, is really great and i've found that i've uh, i've already had a lot taken a lot of learnings from uh, from our partnership together um i think that in terms of numbers as well for us we want to be active in at least five countries by 2023 and, and have, have had more, more than 100 successful internships. And we think that, or well, I strongly believe that our, our partnership together and certainly let's grow in order for me to do that, I'm gonna to have to grow. Um, and so I'm really, really looking forward, uh, looking forward to, to that uh, in, terms of, in terms of the numbers. And then I think finally, one thing I've really loved is actually learning about the levels of growth. So as, as an entrepreneur trying to learn from other entrepreneurs, there are certain aspects that I've that I've learned 
um, you know, going forward. So a couple of a couple of them would be, you know, understanding that you things like you always have you always have time. You can take your time to think over think over things in a, in a uh, in a sense and. Also looking at things such as um, what Jeff Bezos talks around the two way door. So is it a decision where it's if you go through this door, you can come out immediately or it's actually a long term decision? I think those are things that you generally learn in the entrepreneurial community. But what I've learned from uh, from Bridgewater is really more around those levels of growth, something that I hadn't been exposed to before and something that I'm trying to now implement in my business. So I think three specific ones that I that I love and trying to read a little bit more into is. Number one, regarding the average revenue per user. So looking at the right pricing. So how are you actually pricing yourself and are you pricing yourself out of the market or are you actually at that right price point? It's a very, very difficult thing to get right. Um, I think the second one is, is around the retention play. So creating a moated business. How do you actually do that? It's such an easy thing to say, we've got a moated business, but do you actually have it? And it's something that I've, you know, it has taught me to question myself. Um, you know, is the internal remoted business or if not, how can I get there? Um, and I think the final one is that is the brand is the brand development. So making sure that you have the right um, the right brand, a brand that is essentially trusted. And that's what, again, the Bridgewater partnership brings is that Bridgewater is a trusted brand. And what that means as a trusted platform means that the conversations that I know I'm going to have with those on the platform are going to be meaningful and are going to be valuable to me so i know there's there's no wasted time you know that uh, our mission is to help companies to grow so all the participants that we have are here to grow can you tell us more specifically how can you help these participants that uh, you have already on bridgewood that are your peers in bridgewood how can you help them in this specific task of growing Sure, exactly. So um, it's a great question. And in keeping with in keeping with that, a couple of areas where I think that we're really helping companies to grow is number one, giving giving companies an international team. And I think that having an international international team is extremely important. And within that, having someone from the UK, an ambitious student from the UK is massively, massively helpful. So one of the pieces of feedback that we got from working with a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurs is that they're often looking at raising capital. And one of the ways that they do that is by writing investor decks in English. And so if you can ensure that your investor deck is written in perfect English, that will allow you to look for investment from not only <clears throat> the UK, the US, but actually globally. And as a, I'm sure both, you know, Anna and Paolo, you both speak perfect English. And I'm sure that that's helped you a lot in your, in your business careers to grow personally, socially, and also, you know, within, um, within the stream, within, within whatever stream you, you've wanted to do. So I think the first, the first element is really getting that international, international team and getting that English language up to scratch. The second area would probably be around access to the UK market. So one of the things that these students bring with them which is exactly what Bridgewater brings to us, is a network. So a lot of these students are work, who, who are from top class universities have a huge network that they bring with them now and also will do in, uh, in the future. So what you're allowing your, yourself to do, as well as your team, is build that, build that international network. Um, and then I guess the final, the final part, which we really try to, uh, try to push on, is we like to help build entrepreneurial teams. That's what we do by, by putting these students through our internship, pre-internship training programs. We've also had some, some companies ask if other of their uh, employees can go through the programs. That's what we try to do. We try to, to, to instill a mindset that allows their employees to feel that they can challenge the, challenge the status quo. Um, we only work with, with entrepreneurs. And so this is something that naturally gets instilled in what in what we're doing and quite often it's that challenge of the status quo which really allows you to uh to go to that next level of next level of growth to build that new revenue line michael tell us about your future development plans and how does iberia fit in the internal plans sure so uh very highly actually so um spain is is now our largest market and 
quite often it depends on um initially i'd started with with students who studied certain languages which meant that naturally if they studied portuguese or if they studied spanish or italian they would naturally go to those um those companies or well, sorry to those countries and then since then we built it out so that we have students across economics politics maths physics computer science which means that actually they're not they have they're, they're essentially country agnostic to a large extent and so will allow themselves to or give themselves the opportunity to choose where they'd like to go and uh, the number of times i hear spain portugal and i'm sure it's probably for uh, perhaps for the weather the food the, the people etc um for us iberia really sits in that core area for from from a student perspective the second um the second area is obviously from uh, from the companies themselves so from um from the investment that is pouring in from a venture capital perspective from an angel investor perspective into startups in iberia is um is growing and is set to grow for um for the future as well so that is something that we're really keeping um keeping an eye on so in terms of those those future developments from a country perspective uh for me iberia is is, is an is an essential place for um for us to be so i'm keen to keen to grow that and similarly from an area from a perspective of not trying to have too many eggs in one basket it's important that we get uh, a spread of clients across uh, across countries in uh, in europe so so Iberia certainly does just fit into those and, uh, and 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 as I've said before, Spain being our biggest market at the moment, we're keen to that and now develop that larger as well. You know that in, in this podcast, uh, our last question is always the same. Uh, what is your definition of growth? I think uh, so it's a it's a brilliant question and uh, I've listened to a couple of the previous podcasts and have been very impressed by some of the definitions that have been there so hopefully um uh hopefully mine mine can be almost as good um or at least getting somewhere there so i think that the this sort of question is uh, is a tricky one in the sense that the definition of um the definition of growth in and of itself is not necessarily straightforward and so i think that um similarly as companies want to grow the reason that bridgewater has You know, 20 levels of growth is that it's not a straightforward answer to um to how you grow but the way that i see it is sort of splitting growth into two different uh different areas so one i split growth into stages and the other one i split into growth types so what i mean by that is looking at it slightly um slightly like a matrix to to some extent so the first stage i would see is uh essentially moving from zero to one so this is where either You're looking at developing a business. You're an entrepreneur, or a new, uh, a new revenue, new revenue line, for example. So, within this part, you shouldn't really necessarily be looking at metrics such as what was our revenue, but you want to be looking at maybe the number of users that we're that we're increasing by. What's the growth there? So that's the sort of the first stage of zero to one. The second one is then more around what about if we're moving from one to several? So this is looking at that sort of next layer of growth, starting to build your business. You're starting to track revenue figures. But you're trying to build a sustainable and hopefully recurring business model, and that final stage, which I think is really where Bridgewater is helping its um, its its customers and its network, is how do you go from several to many? So that's sort of that third stage of growth. That you're more focused on sort of several levers that you can use to um, to do that. So be that optimizing your sales process all the way through to your actual inorganic plays. So do we have do we have the do we have the skills in house to build this particular product or um or this area of growth or do we look uh, do we look elsewhere do we look through through an M&A strategy so that's sort of the stages of growth that i see and then in terms of the type of growth i probably break it into two so one being commercial growth and the other one being entrepreneurial growth so commercial growth is i would probably term that as how can we increase revenue because i think revenue is a big figure when we look at, when we look at big element when we look at growth but how can we increase revenue from existing products so can we go into new geographies can we make our pricing um make our pricing more efficient whereby we're uh, essentially looking more into that sort of price elasticity of demand and trying to see how can we change price to change um to change revenue how can we build marketing and loyalty so i think that's sort of the commercial type of growth and then on the entrepreneurial growth this is really around new business lines new products and a lot more uncertainty where you're testing testing the market so 
I guess, Paolo, I probably haven't answered your question directly um, or is in, in the most straightforward way that I could, but that's how I see growth. I think it's, it's a great answer, okay? And a great answer to finish this podcast. Michael, it was a pleasure having you with us and listen to the internal experience, which is great. With growth at the center of the, its priorities, the internal is a Bridgewater participant, having joined our community last year. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Anna. It's been a pleasure. It was great having you, Michael. If growth is also your priority, know more about us through our bridgewatt.com website, watch our videos on YouTube, and follow us on LinkedIn. See you soon, Bridgewatt. Let's grow.